you have a Bible with you, you want to turn to John chapter 3, we're going to read verse 16. That is, might be a familiar verse to some of you. <clears throat> you know, um, what is probably the most prized possession in, um, in our home? I probably let you, yeah, you guys will probably guess, it's, it's, it's the remote control. And um, it's, I, I love that thing. So, you know, if there's ever a fire, it's, I understand the order, family, remote control, and then, you know, and if there's time, go get the dog. But the, the thing of it is, um, I, I love the remote control, and one of my favorite buttons on the remote control is the fast forward button. I love that button, because that little button lets me skip over a whole bunch of stuff that I don't want to see. And, and if I was honest with you, I would rather watch recorded TV or something like Netflix, because uh, in live TV, you can't fast forward. You have to watch all the commercials. You have to watch all the stuff. Um, I, I realize you can change the channel, but, but I, like to, I like to click through and get exactly where I want to be. And I love to watch, like the Cowboys are my favorite team in the whole wide world, and I love to watch, I record every game, and I like to watch the games on recording, because then I can just, man, I can just fly through a game, and I can go right to the, to the highlights and, and, and watch the, <laughs> the one touchdown, they score the whole game. You know, I, I can... And, and over and over, but I, I love that button because you don't have to you don't have to mess with anything else. And it's if things are moving a little too slow for me, or if I, I don't like what's going on in the movie, I can just it's great. It's a wonderful button. But when it comes to Easter, I think a lot of people wish that we we had a fast forward button. In other words, we want to fast forward to to next Sunday, Easter Sunday. Uh, but before we can get to Easter, okay, we have to. We have to go to the cross. We have to go to the cross. We are an Easter people. Easter means new beginnings. Easter means new life. Easter means he's alive. But before he comes back, he has to go. He has to go first. And there's a lot of people who just want to skip over that part. We want to, we want to skip over the part because it's, it's messy. It's, 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 it's dark. It's depressing. It's... It's, it's not, it looks, like, it looks like we lose. But we have to go to the cross. This morning we're talking about, we're having a conversation about the heart of God. And, and we see the heart of God displayed in the cross. And John 3, 16 is, is a perfect verse that captures God's heart for us and what he was willing to do in order for us to be in relationship with him. So I'm going to read John chapter 3, verse 16. And this is uh, my Bible. It says, For God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only Son that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Now, see, for some of you, that was, that was probably the very first Bible, uh, Bible verse that you ever memorized. John 3, 16. And you could say it just like that. And if, even if you've never been in church before or never read the Bible, you probably had some sort of exposure to John 3, 16. Maybe you even saw it at a, at a sporting event. Someone was host, holding a poster that said John 3, 16. And you always wondered what, what, what that meant. Well, now you know what that meant. It's, it's probably one of the, if not the most famous verse in the Bible. And its impact is so great because just in a few words, it captures the entire heart of God. In fact, you could compress that verse down to just four words. And some of you have heard this before. You could, you could just bring it down to four words. God loved, God gave. I mean, that's, that's it. That's the message of the gospel right there. God loved, God gave. What did he love? He loved us, you, all of you, all of, all of me. Um, uh, he loved the world. That's, that's who he loved. God saw us, and he, and he saw where our lives were headed apart from him. He saw the brokenness that we were in and the brokenness that we couldn't get out of. We, we couldn't fix it on our own. He saw us there, and he loved us so much that he didn't want to leave us there. And that's, that's I don't know if you've ever thought about that, but God, he could have left us there. He could have left us right here, right in broken we were broken, hopeless, separated from him forever. He had every right to do that. We didn't deserve his love. We don't deserve his forgiveness. We don't deserve uh, this church word salvation, his, his saving us 
from an eternal separation from him. We, didn't, we don't deserve the second chance or the third chance or, or the 50th chance. He could have left us right where we were. And he would have been right. But he saw us and he loved us so much that he wanted to make a way out of that mess that we couldn't, that we'd gotten ourselves into. He loved, so he gave. And what did he give? Well, he gave of himself. He gave himself. He didn't pawn this job off to someone else. He took the action himself. He came down from heaven to earth in the form of his son, Jesus Christ. And he came into a lot of, see, a lot of people don't want to get messy. A lot of people don't want to jump into the middle of, of yuck. They, they, they just, they, they try to avoid it. But what God did is God came right down in the middle of our mess. And what he did was, is he sent Jesus to die on a cross for our sins. He gave us his one and only son. And Jesus knew it. Jesus knew that he would go to the cross. He talked about it. He told his disciples that, he, that this was going to happen. They didn't necessarily want to hear that talk or they didn't really want to believe that. But that's why he came. Jesus came to die. Jesus came to die. He came to die so that you and I, we could live. So before we get, before we get to Easter, we have to, we have to go to the cross. And what does, what does the cross teach us? What, is, what does that cross tell us? And um, there's a lot of things, but I, I just want to give you four really quickly. Uh, and these, if you like to take notes, these are in your bulletin. But the, the first thing is the cross, it was a rescue mission. It was a rescue mission. Luke 19.10 says, The Son of Man came to look for and to save people who were lost. It was a rescue mission. And the scary thing is that there are so many of us who have no idea that we're even lost. We don't know that we're lost. There's people not only out in the world, out in culture, but there's people right in here. We don't know that we're lost. We, we don't, in fact, we, we, we don't want to hear that we're lost. We're fine. We don't need saving. What do we need saving from? Life is good. Job's good. Family's good. Everything, I, I'm good. What, what do I need saving from? So much of the world says, you know, we're, we're okay. I can do life without God. We don't need God. But you see, the cross was God turning on this bright light in the darkness, in the dark world. The cross pointed people to God's love, to God's hope, to God's forgiveness, to God's restoration, to his, to his peace. It was, it's this beacon that's calling to a lost world. It's calling to people like you and me, people who would say, I don't, my life is okay. Or people who would say, my life is a mess. The truth is, we're all a mess, and God is calling us. And as his followers, we're called to point people to Jesus. We're a part of that rescue mission. You see, Jesus, he left, he left heaven. He left the grandeur of heaven. He left perfection. He left what was perfect to come down into the middle of imperfection. He left peace to come into chaos. The whole idea of this rescue mission, it speaks, it speaks to the heart of God. He knew and he knows that we're lost. He knows that this world is broken. He knows that all of us, we choose our own way over him all the time. And Jesus left heaven to rescue us. And a lot of you have, have seen um, rescue operations. Maybe even some of you who have maybe have been a part of one. Uh, but maybe you've, you've seen one in person or you've seen it on the news or you've uh, seen it on TV shows or movies or whatever or read about them. One of my favorite rescue missions was uh, Apollo 13. And some of, you, some of you are old enough to remember, like you, you lived through that. You saw that actually happen, happening on TV and this whole thing playing out. But if you remember, um, I, I saw the movie first and then I read the book. Uh, the book is called Lost Moon. But uh, Apollo 13, if you remember the movie, it's, it's when Forrest Gump was going to go into space. And Forrest was going to go with Lieutenant Dan too. And he was also going to go with one of the brothers from the movie Tombstone. You remember those three guys? Well, Lieutenant Dan was, they found, the doctor said, well, he's going to be sick while you're in space, so Lieutenant Dan can't go, so we got to bring the guy from Footloose to go in your place. <laughs> it's a good movie. You should see it. Actually, uh, those are actors that played the real guys, Jim Lovell, Fred Hayes, and Jack Swagger. And on the way to the moon, on the way to the moon, there was an explosion on their spaceship. 
on, on, on their vessel. And a myriad of things started going wrong, not the least of that their oxygen started leaking out into space. And if you know anything about space, you got to have oxygen to survive. So this, this was bad. Uh, matter of fact, you, the, the famous line from the movie, Houston, we have a problem. And, and the problem was that they've got to figure out what to do and how, how, to, how, to, how to survive this. Because if they don't, they're going to die in space. And, and if you remember when this, when this happened, what, what started happening back here on earth the minute that that started going on? Nothing. Nothing. The guys at NASA, they, they were looking at it, and they were like, man, I, I, I hope these guys figure this out. You know, they, they started sending good thoughts their way. I don't know what that means, but people say it all the time. Send them good thoughts. They were sending them good. No, they didn't do that. The minute that that problem arose, it lit up all their boards too, and they began immediately, every, all the resources of NASA, all the smartest people in the world got together and said, we got to figure out how to bring these guys back home we got to figure out how to rescue them, because if we don't rescue them, they're going to die out there. They're going to die, and they're going to be out there forever. we got to figure out how to bring them back home, back to where they belong. You see, God saw us in our brokenness, and he didn't sit up in heaven and say, man, I hope these people figure this thing out. I mean, good luck. I, I, I don't, I'm not too sure. No. He came down to the earth he came to rescue us, to pull us out of brokenness into a new life. And he did that through the cross. The cross was a rescue mission. It was a mission to bring us back to where we belong in relationship with him. The cross is a rescue mission. The second thing is the cross, it was a ransom. The cross was a ransom. In Matthew 20, 28, we, say just, we see that it says, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. The Greek word that used there for ransom, it was a word that was most commonly used for the purchase price to free slaves. The, the, the price that it cost to, 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 to free someone out of slavery, it was called a ransom. And I can't think of a better uh, a word to describe what we're talking about, what Jesus did on the cross. His death set us free. His death, it, 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 paid, it paid to get us out of slavery, to free us from the slavery of sin. In 1 Corinthians, it talks about how we are, we are not our own. We've been bought with a price. Well, that price, that price was the ransom that Jesus paid. And, and what, did, what did it cost him? What was the price? What was the price to, to free us from our sin? Well, it was death, the death of Jesus, God's own son. That was the price. That was, that was the ransom. Jesus was tortured, he was beaten, he was whipped, he was humiliated, he was crucified, all because God loved you and he loved me. All because he, he loved the world. You see, that right there, the cross, that was, that was supposed to be us. It should have been us. That's what we deserved. In Romans, the Bible says that the wages, what we earn because of our sin, what we should get because of our sin... Our rightful wages is death. And it's not just a physical death, but it's also an eternal death. A death that never ends. Suffering that never ends. Loneliness that never ends. Fear that never ends. Pain that never ends. Sorrow that never ends. This is, this is what we earned. This is what we deserve. But Jesus stepped in at just the right time, and he took all of that for us. See, for those that love Jesus, for those that surrender their lives to him, the good news is that because of the cross, because of the ransom that was paid, the suffering, the loneliness, the fear, the pain, the sorrow, one day it will all come to an end. It will all come to an end. That's the hope that we have in Christ. And that's the hope that we have because he paid that price. Now, here's something that I don't want you to miss. Jesus' crucifixion, it was, it was real. It was real. He felt every bit of it. Now, some people may think, well, he was, he was God, and so that, that gave him the, the superpower to, to, to handle what he went through and, and blah, blah, blah. He didn't know because, he, see, he was, he was God, but he came down to this earth in the form of a man. So he, he felt every bit of it, the, 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 the fists to the face, the, the rods to, to his head that, that he was beaten with. He felt those. He felt the, 
the, the whip, the whippings that he took on his back. He felt his flesh being torn by the whips. Some of you know that in, those, in the strands, in the leather strands of the whips were bone fragments and rock and other sharp fragments that they used to whip people. And those things would just, they would whip you on your back and it would go into your skin and then they would turn and pull and it would literally rip the skin off of you. He felt that. He felt the crown of thorns go into his head. Some scholars believe that the, the, the thorns that they used from the tree that they found it were at least, at least two inches, two inches long, if not longer. And he would feel that being pushed, shoved down. I mean, you guys know what it's like when you step on a sticker. Can you imagine a crown of thorns being shoved on your head? He felt that. His body, he felt dehydration. He felt exhaustion. He felt his muscles cramping. He felt the, the nails that went into his hands and in his feet. The, the shock that his body would go into. He felt it. He, he experienced every bit of it. Every bit of pain. Every bit of suffering. Every bit of humiliation. Every bit of abandonment from the people, the so-called people that loved him. Jesus died on the cross for you and me. He paid that price, that ransom. That's, that's what it costs for our freedom. We didn't earn it. We didn't deserve it. He did it because he loved his father and he did it because he loved us. And if you look at that first part of that verse again, it says the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve. I mean, what did, what did Jesus really deserve? Not that. You see, because he was the king of kings, the Lord of lords. He was the author of creation. He was a perfect. He was the son of God. If anyone in history, anyone in history deserved to be served, it was him. But he chose to serve us. And his greatest act of service was when he paid the ransom on the cross. The third thing there, the cross was about reconciliation. Reconciliation. Uh, one commentary wrote, Reconciliation comes from the Greek meaning change or, or an exchange. Reconciliation involves a change in the relationship between God and man. It, it, it assumes that there has been a breakdown in the relationship. But now there has been a change from a state of enmity and fragmentation to one of harmony and fellowship. In Romans, Paul talks about that before the reconciliation happened, before the cross we, as a people, we were powerless. We were ungodly, sinners, enemies, enemies of God. We were under God's wrath. But because of the change, because of the reconciliation, we become new creatures. In 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. That happened on the cross. The old was gone. You see, Jesus took what belonged to us, our sin, he took our sin, and what he gave us was his righteousness. He made us right. He reconciled us to God. We use the word brokenness a lot here at FBC Allen. It's, it's a word that we use to describe our world. It doesn't take long to turn on the TV or, or look online or, or maybe even just some of us look in our own homes and we see the brokenness of our world. So we use it to talk about our world. We use it to talk about um, our relationship between God and man. We call it broken because it's, it's not whole. It's not the way it should be. It's fractured. And the cause of that brokenness is our sin, our own choices. When we choose to do what we want over what choose what God wants us to do. It goes all the way back to, to Adam and Eve in the garden. The minute that they chose to do their own thing and not to follow God's perfect design, they fractured the perfect relationship they had with God. And you see, they, they, were, they were put outside of the garden, put outside of the place that God had created, the perfect place that God had created for them to enjoy His creation, to enjoy one another, and to enjoy perfect fellowship with God. Sin broke that. It broke that. And the relationship wasn't perfect anymore. And the relationship with one another wasn't perfect anymore. We also see, we see it back in, in, in the Old Testament when we look at the, the temple, the synagogue in, in, in the temple. There was, in there, there was the Holy of Holies. And some of you have heard about this, but 
This was the innermost sacred area in the ancient tabernacle um, or, or the temple of Jerusalem. And it contained the Ark of the Covenant. And this was the symbol of, of Israel's special relationship with God. This, it, it, it was about God's presence with them. And the Holy of Holies, it was only accessible by the Israelite high priest. And he only went in there once a year on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. The, the high priest, he was the only one admitted to go into this small kind of small windowless enclosure. It was, it was, kind of, it was a perfect square. And he went in there uh, to, with incense and to sprinkle uh, the blood of the sacrificial animal on the mercy seat of the ark. And by doing so, what he did was he, he atoned for his own sins and the sins of the people. And the Holy of Holies, it was, and, and, and again, only one time a year, and only the high priest could enter into that because that was where the presence of God was. And the Holy of Holies was separated by this large veil, this large curtain. It was huge, it was thick, and, and it separated it from the rest of it because no one, no one could go into the presence of, of God. Why? Because of that brokenness, because of our sin. It separates, it separated us from God. It separated God and man. But look, but look what Jesus did on the cross. We're gonna read this in Hebrews, it'll be on the screen. It says, and so, dear brothers and sisters, this, look, look how this is different now because of Jesus. We can boldly enter heaven's most holy place, the holy of holies, okay? Now we don't have the temple anymore, so the holy of holies, now we're talking about the presence of God. We can enter the most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. So what that did was it made it so there was no more curtain. Because when Jesus died on the cross in the temple, the curtain that separated the Holy of Holies literally tore in half from top to bottom. Not so that man could do it, but this was, this was an act of God. And Jesus' death, what it did was it tore that veil so that the representation was there was no longer anything separating us from God. Our sin had been taken care of. And now, as, as people of God, we could enter into his presence. We could have direct access. Jesus, his death fixed the brokenness. It restored the relationship between God and man. It made it possible for, come, for us to come to God. There was no longer the, the high priest who needed to go to God before us. We could now come to God with him and we could enter his presence. I love the way that verse says boldly. We come humbly, but we come boldly like, like a child comes to their father. He opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain in the most holy place. Jesus gave us direct access to God. He gave that to all of us, all of us. Remember John three sixteen that whoever believes in him. The relationship is no longer broken. It's no longer fractured. Now through Jesus' death, we can be restored to what God originally intended for us. And the cross made that possible. The fourth thing, the, the cross was, was a revolution. It was a revolution. John 13, 34 says, I give you a new command. Love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. You see, this, the cross, that, the Jewish people, that was not what they were expecting at all. That was not what they were expecting. Even his disciples, I said this earlier, his closest followers, they weren't entirely 100% sure what Jesus was up to. He talked about it with them, but they, they never truly got it. Matter of fact, there's one time where he said it, and, and Peter said, no way, God. And Jesus told him, listen, Peter, you don't know what you're saying. You, you, need to, you need to stop right there because this is God's plan for my life. This is why I came. I came to go to that cross. Remember, he said, get behind me, Satan. He told that to Peter. He because if you're not about this, then you're not about me. So his followers didn't truly get it. The Jews, the Jews were ready for Christ to come and, and restore them to power. They were, they were God's chosen people, and, and they thought Jesus was coming, and he was going to be, he was going to restore them to political power because Rome was over, they were, they were the political power in play. They were the military power in play, and they were over everyone. And what the Jews thought Jesus was going to do is he was going to restore their kingdom. Matter of fact, when they 
When he came in, we talked about it with the kids. On, today is Palm Sunday, and it's called Palm Sunday because when Jesus came into Jerusalem that week of the week of Easter, he came, and they were celebrating. They were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, and they were laying palm, palm leaves down in his feet, and, and palm, palm leaves uh, represented victory. And so they were, they were so excited because, because Hosanna was here. And Hosanna is actually a, Jew, a, a Hebrew word, and it means save, please. And right up behind the please is this giant exclamation point. It was, it was a cry to God for help. You see, but they, they were crying for a warrior king. They were crying for a military king. You see, Jesus was going to do exactly what they wanted. He was going to save them, but not exactly how they wanted it or even how they expected it. No one expected that. Jesus came to save, and the way that he saved was by a loving sacrifice. He says, a new command I give to you, not just to love. Love wasn't new. What was new was the way that he loved, the way that he told them to love. You see, when Jesus shares those words with his disciples, he has just finished what, what we call the Last Supper. He's, it's, it's the night before, before he goes to the cross, and he's, he's been betrayed. And what, what has happened is, is he's finished the meal with him, and now he, is, he, is, he has just finished washing the disciples' feet. And so when he says, a new command to give to you, love, love one another as I have loved you, as I have just showed you. And what the washing of the feet is, it's kind of a little, uh, it's a preview, a precursor to the washing of our sins through the blood, through his own blood that's about to happen. You see, he said the way, the way to love, the way to make a difference in people's lives, the way to draw people to him is through love. And not just any type of love but a sacrificial love. It's a love that no one expects. No one expects that. Jesus shouldn't have washed their feet. No one expected him to do that. No, it never came to their mind that he would do that. It never came to their mind for any one of them to do it. But for Jesus to get up and do that, no one thought that. He shouldn't have done that. That was a servant's job. Matter of fact, it was the lowest of the lowest of the servant's job. And Jesus shouldn't have died on the cross. No one expected that. He didn't deserve that. But Jesus showed his ultimate greatness by serving others. The, rec- the cross, it's a reminder of God's love. It's a reminder of God's sacrifice. It's a reminder of God's call for us, a call to action. He started the revolution, and we're called to join him by giving our lives to him, believing that he is the son of God, that he lived a perfect life, that he died on a cross to save us from our sins. You see, the cross tells us there's, there's, there's a different way to do things. Because the world was all about themselves. And Jesus says, listen, it's not about, greatness isn't achieved by being all about you. Greatness is, be, is achieved by loving one another. A sacrificial love. 